When arranging a group of images, it will become apparent to their maker that either the order they appear in is important to understanding these pictures, or it isn't. A sequence, by definition, has a specific order. It has a start and an end. As such, a sequence has a transition of idea from start to finish. For example, in a sequence of three pictures, the first will relate to the second, and the second will relate to the third, but without the second image, the first may not directly relate to the third. Conversely, a series consists of related parts whose resonance helps build their meaning, but these images need not be seen in a specific order. The serial image relies on multiplicity to drive home their message, but can be arranged in any order or sequence to create the same conclusion. Serial images have no transition of idea. In the art world and in art criticism, series and sequence, serial and sequential, are often used interchangeably, but they have different meanings. This is a dictionary definition of both, serial, of, related to, consisting, or arranged in a series. So it's a group of images. Sequence, a following of one thing after another, secession, an order of secession, arrangement, a related continuous series, the act of following. In those dictionary definitions, a sequence implies a specific order, generally a start, middle, and an end, where serial, in serial the images can be seen in any order and make the same sense. A sequence, if not followed in order, would make little or less sense. A.D. Coleman wrote of the sequence, In the same way that a frame or division in a picture can imply a relationship that had not existed previously, two or more pictures put together or in a sequence can give a more intense view than a single picture, the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Photography has increasingly moved away in recent years from the simple, or possibly not so simple, series of pictures telling an anecdotal or narrative story to a more complex way of juxtaposing images, and away from objective reporting to a more personal, internal vision. You might remember this Dwayne Michaels sequence, Things Are Queer, normally seen one at a time from one to nine here, where each part of the sequence re reveals something new. If you jumbled up the sequence, it doesn't make the same order. It's designed in a circle. Peter Bennell, the former photo historian at Princeton University, wrote, Alfred Stieglitz taught that not all photographs need function as individual or summational works, but that certain images in a structured context could serve support of others and could create a tonal statement more complex and could create a tonal statement more complex and multifaceted than single works alone or loose assortments of related pictures. Serial, on the other hand, of or related to, consisting or arranged in a series. Serial imagery, like the Claude Monet paintings, could be seen in any order and make the same sense. His repetition of both subject and perspective in most of these pictures reduces them to their intent and their meaning about color and light. A sequence is a series, but a series, as in these, do not need to be sequential. Andy Warhol's comment and hit pop art in general sometimes mocked order and homogeneity. I'm not a German photography expert or a German historian or have anything other than a foreign view of German life and culture. I'm not an expert in German psychology and I'm not a psychologist. But an observation is that there's a propensity for German photographers some of the biggest names in German photography of the 20th century to work in a serial mode. 
Let me make my case by showing you some of these photographers. August Sanders started his greatest photographic project somewhere around 1910. His aim was to produce a catalog of the representative types of people living in German society. In that, they're time and place specific. Most of these photographs are from the late 20s and the 30s in Germany. His first book in 1929, A Face of Our Time, had Sander described as Quote, the most important German portrait photographer of the early 20th century. That was essentially folded into his grander project, People of the 20th Century, is the modern translation. This was Sanders' monumental, lifelong photographic project to document the people of his native Germany, stating, We know that people are formed by the light and air, but their inherited traits and their actions. We can tell from appearance the work someone does or does not do. We can read in his face whether he is happy or troubled. His portraits of both individuals and small groups of people often show them in their working clothes and sometimes in their work environments. They're captioned by occupation, not by the person's name. School teacher, musician, student, farmer, peasant, banker, unemployed man, or sometimes by their relationships, sons, widower, twins. Cumulatively, their intent is to provide this portrait of the German society. Sanders' simple and straightforward approach allows us to study the subject individually as well as within the context of the whole project. They're both record and statement. While Nazi ideology stressed Aryan purity, Sanders' work showed the German nation to be cosmopolitan and extremely varied, with few examples that fit their model. Perhaps this is why they burnt Sanders' work when they encountered it. Although ultimately the Nazis did ban his portraits in the 1930s because the subjects did not adhere to the Aryan ideal, Sander continued to make photographs, but after 1934 his work turned largely to nature and architectural studies. The project was cumulative. It was important to see the variety of different people. We could have seen these in any order, and they'd make the same sense. In this case, these works are time and place specific. They are meant to be about German people during a particular period of time. But the groundwork is set for serial photography. Another German artist working in a serial fashion in the first part of the 20th century was Karl Blasfeld. He began collecting plant material for a drawing class. He started systematically photographing plant samples, documenting them to use as samples in class later. He had traveled to Greece, Italy, and North Africa from 1890 to 1896, working for Moritz Maurer a German decorative artist who made casts of botanical specimens. They theorized that natural forms form the basis of art. In 1926, Blasfeld's work was featured in an avant-garde Berlin gallery to great success. His publication, translated, Form and Nature, 
1928 was both a critical and popular success. This modernist botanical study contains 120 photogravure plates prefaced with an introductory text and a list of subjects. A second edition published in several countries in 1929 contained the same images and text. The English edition was given the title Art Forms in Nature. By repeating his formal approach, he essentially lessens the photographer's presence. By photographing the plants from the same angle, from the same perspective, from a similar distance, from image to image, lessens the presence of the photographer. We're no longer thinking about the photographer's thoughts about form. The form becomes a given, so what we're left with is subject. Later photographers will largely add social or historic subject matter to their artifacts, photographing essentially social artifacts. The book Form in Nature was included in the Book of Books, 101 seminal photo books of the 20th century. Byrne and Hilla Becker were a photographic team and a married couple. They met at the Dusseldorf Academy. They began collaborating together in 1959 after meeting in 1957. Byrne originally studied painting and then typography. Hilla had training as a commercial photographer. After two years of collaboration, they married. They had their first gallery exhibition in 1963. The Beckers called the subjects of their photographs anonymous sculptures, and they produced a successful photo book of that same title. The book Anonymous Sculptures was published in 1970 and is their most well-known body of work. The title is a nod to Marcel Duchamp's ready-mades and indicates that the Beckers referred to the industrial buildings essentially as found objects. Their work was brought to international acclaim in 1975 with their inclusion in George Eastman House's exhibition and catalog, New Topographics. They first collaborated on photographing documenting the disappearing German industrial architecture. The Becker's subject matter included industrial structures like water towers, coal bunkers, gas tanks, and factories. Their images had a documentary style. They were always in black and white and never included people. They exhibited their work in sets or typologies, as they called them, groupings of several photographs of the same type of structure. They're well known for these grid formations that we're seeing them here. Many of these are installation shots from galleries. Hilla said, by placing several cooling towers side by side, something happened. Something like tonal music. You don't see what makes the objects different until you bring them together. So subtle are their differences. Michael Collins, in his piece, The Long Look, wrote, They are lines on the face of the world. The photographs are portraits of history, and when the structures have been demolished and grassed over as though they were never there, the pictures remain. In 1990, they received an award at the Venice Biennale, not for photography, but sculpture, due to their ability to illustrate the sculptural properties of architecture. They said, We photograph water towers and furnaces because they are honest, they are functional, and they reflect what they do. That is what we liked. In 2002, 
they received the Erasmus Prize annually awarded to, quote, individuals or institutions that have made exceptional contributions to culture, society, or social science in Europe and the rest of the world. In 2004, they won the Hasselblad Award for their work and roles as both photography professors of art at the Dusseldorf Academy of Art. Thomas Ruff studied photography from 1977 to 1985 with both Byrne and Hilla Becker. You'll see their influence on him as well as his use of serial imagery. Ruff names Walker Evans, Eugene Atjay, Carl Blosfeld, Stephen Shore, and William Eggleston as his main influences. The work I'm showing you, Portraits, is a conceptual series of serial photography. He made these images from 1981 to 1985. They're portraits of friends and acquaintances. Typically, they're shown with emotionless expressions in very large passport-style portraits in great detail and high resolution. In a discussion in the Journal for Contemporary Art in 1993, Ruff mentions a connection between these portraits and the police observation methods in Germany in the 1970s. He made 60 half-length portraits. These passport-like images have even lighting, the subjects generally between 25 and 35 years old, made with a medium format negative. He uses a solid background in different colors, depicting the individual people emotionless, face on, front of a plain background. Ruff experimented with large format printing in 1986, ultimately producing photographs of up to five by seven feet. When I first encountered his work, I saw it at the St. Louis Art Museum, and it was one of those giant photographs. It's the first time that I had come across a work that size. It was mounted on the back of a piece of plexiglass, large scale color print, really detailed, really quite impressive just in terms of the monumental scale. Art critic Charles Hagen, writing in the New York Times, commented, Blown up to wall size proportions, the photographs look like gigantic banners of Eastern European dictators. I'll try to do my German exchange students proud and pronunciate Thomas Strutz's name correctly. Strutz trained at the Dusseldorf Academy from 1970 until 1980, studied painting with Gerhard Richter, but he was increasingly drawn to photography, and with Richter's support, Strut joined the first year of a new photography class run by Byrne and Hilla Becker. This was in 1976. His museum series of photographs featured imagery of people gathering in churches, museums, and other public places. They're photographed with a large format negative in lush detail. In essence, in his work, the spectator becomes part of what is spectated. One critic wrote about his work, his inquiry of the relationships between men, time, and history, Thomas Strutt has produced a notable set of photographs taken inside churches and museums. For the first time, the artist works in large format color. These places of conservation and memory constitute a fascinating testimony to our contemporary relation to works of art. Although none of them is particularly similar, church and museum photographs present a common composition. Typically in the background they are huge or famous paintings and majestic architecture, while the foreground is often occupied by people admiring the background's pieces of art. 
People may sometimes be blurred or moving because of the time required to take the photograph. This reinforces the power and permanence of the artworks compared to the brevity of the visitor's presence in the museum, but also on Earth. Andres Gursky is a photographer and professor at the Dusseldorf Academy of Art in Germany. He shares a studio with Thomas Ruff and others. From 1981 to 1987, he studied at the Dusseldorf Academy and was taught by Bern and Hilla Becker. Gursky demonstrates a similar methodical approach in his own large-scale serial photography. His other notable influences were the British landscape photographer John Davies, who made high-detailed, high-vantage-point images, and American photographer Joel Sternfeld. Gursky first exhibited his work in Germany in 1985, his first solo show in 1988. Gursky's first one-person museum exhibition in the United States opened at the Milwaukee Art Museum in 1998, and his work was the subject of a retrospective organized by the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2001. His work has been seen internationally, including at the Venice Biennale in 1990 and 2004, and the Biennial of Sydney in 1996 and 2000. This photograph, 99 cents, taken in 1999, it was taken at a 99 cent store on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. Of it, one critic said, quote, Neatly labeled packets are transformed into fields of color generated by endless array of identical products reflecting off the shiny ceiling. This photograph one time set the world record for the most money spent on a single photograph. I don't keep track of those things, but it was something like $2.1 million. That's been eclipsed several times since, and indeed, it's no longer even the most expensive Andrus Gursky photograph. Before the 1990s, Gursky did not digitally manipulate his images, but in the years since, he's been frank about his reliance on computers both to edit and at times enhance his pictures, sometimes creating spaces larger than the actual subjects. Like some other of the recent German photographers, the scale of his prints is quite big. Thought I'd give you that installation view here to get a sense of the size. And the size matters. They have a presence on the wall, and they're extremely detailed. You can still get up close and look at minute details. Writing in the New Yorker magazine, one critic called these pictures vast, splashy, entertaining, and literally unbelievable. In the same publication, another critic described Gursky as one of the two, quote, masters of the Dusseldorf school. Calvin Tompkins described the experience of confronting one of Gursky's large photographs. The first time I saw photographs of Andres Gursky, I had the disorienting sensation that something was happening, happening to me, I suppose, although it felt more generalized than that. Gursky's huge panoramic color print, some of them up to six feet high by ten feet long, had the presence, the formal power, and in several cases the majestic aura of 19th century landscape paintings without losing any of their meticulously detailed immediately as photographs. The subject matter was the contemporary world seen dispassionately and from a distance. New York's Museum of Modern Art called the artist's work, quote, a sophisticated art of embellished observation. It is thanks to the artfulness of Gursky's fictions that we recognize his world as our own.